This game won the first brilliancy prize in the famous Zurich 1953 Candidates Tournament. Grandmaster Kotov intuitively sacrificed the queen just for a pawn and started a deadly king hunt. Later in the game, in order to avoid the checkmate, Grandmaster Averbach had to give up first the exchange, then the bishop, then the knight and eventually the queen. Averbach started with d4 and Kotov played the old Indian defense. Knight f3, knight d7, knight c3, e5, e4 and unlike in the king's Indian defense, instead of an immediate fianchetto of the dark squared bishop, black develops the bishop to e7. And probably later in the game, after castling kingside and moving the rook to e8, black will uh, reroute the bishop to g7. Bishop e2, short castle, short castle, and c6, taking under control the important squares and opening the queen's diagonal. The queen can move either to a5 or to b6 or to c7. Queen c2, rook e8, now the rook is potentially attacking the e4 pawn because black can capture on d4 at any moment and open the rook's way to e4. Rook d1, white in his turn creates very unpleasant uh, x-ray on the d-file. Bishop f8, opening the rook's way, the bishop moves from the rook's way, and rook b1, so white is preparing the b4 pawn at once, as white is playing actively on the queen side in the king's Indian defense, while, while black is playing actively on the king side. And as white is ready to play b4, Kotov prevents it by playing a5. Now, if white insists on playing b4 immediately by playing a3, preparing b4, then that would have been a little bit premature because black would have captured on d4 and would have opened the rook's way. Now black would attack the e4 pawn twice. It's true, white is defending it twice too, but black would be able, after knight takes d4, to blockade the queen side by playing a4. And it turns out that white wouldn't be able to capture the pawn because the knight must defend the pawn. And in this case, black would simply eliminate the very important central pawn. That's why, before preparing b4 pawn advance, Averbach closes the center, d5, crossing the center, getting the space advantage and exerting very unpleasant pressure on black's position. However, the d5 pawn advance has its downside too. Namely, it weakens the c5 square. And Kotov immediately exploits this. Knight c5. Now the both black knights are attacking the e4 pawn. Bishop e3. So Averbach is threatening to capture the knight. And after d takes c, white would simply capture on c6. And the rook would attack the queen. And black wouldn't be able to recapture the pawn on c6. That's why Kotov moves the queen away from the d file. H3, taking under control the g4 square, preventing black pieces from moving to g4. Bishop d7, rook c1, again creating an x-ray on the c-file, and g6. So black starts preparing the f5 pawn advance, which is black's main weapon in the king's Indian defense. Knight d2, rook uh, b8, so black can also, besides f5, can also think about playing actively on the queen side, namely b5. But after knight b3 and the exchange of the knights, Kotov plays c5, blockading, blocking the, closing the queen side. Now, of course, black wouldn't play b5, but now Kotov makes it clear that his main plan, the main and only plan, is f5. And Brandstein, David Brandstein, in his great book dedicated to this tournament, in his annotations, suggests that white must immediately prepare b4 pawn at once. For this purpose, he recommends queen c2, unblocking the b pawn, and after black plays king h8, vacating the g8 square for the knight, because it's necessary to unblock the f pawn, so that black can play f5, and after that, Brandstein recommends a3, and um, later in the game, white can play b4. But Averbach had another plan. Instead of all this, he played king h2. So Kotov continues his plan, king h8, of course, in order to play knight g8, followed by f5, queen c2, knight g8, 
And now black is ready to play f5. That's why Averbach plays bishop g4, preventing black from playing f5, because the bishop controls the f5 square. And also bishop g4 leads to the exchange of the light squared bishops, which on the one hand is in white's favor, because the white light squared bishop is bad, because as you see, um, central white pawns are placed on the light squares, while the uh, black pawns are placed on the dark squares. So black's light squared bishop is better than a white slide squared bishop. Besides that, uh, the black slide squared bishop takes a very important part in the attack of the king side. On the other hand, however, uh, the side that has a space advantage, as you know, should avoid the exchange of the pieces. So, a court of place, knight h6, attacking the bishop. The bishops are exchanged. Bishop takes d7 and queen takes d7. And one more time in his annotations, Branstein recommends now immediate a3 followed by rook b1 and b4. But instead of this, Averbach plays queen d2, attacking the knight. Now it's attacked two times. That's why Kotov moves it to g8. And now Averbach plays g4 taking under control the f5 square with his g pawn 2. But Kotov still plays f5. So this can lead to the opening of the files on the king side after the mass exchanges uh, of the pawns. That would, of course, lead to the opening of the files on the king side. But as Averbach's pieces, rooks, are still on the queen side, before exchanging the pawns on f5, he wants to move his rooks to the king side. So that's why first he plays f3, so defending his pawns. And after bishop e7, he plays rook g1. Pot of place, rook f8, he does the same. He wants to move his rooks to the king side. Rook f1, the second rook, comes to the king side. Rook f7, so the rook can move to g7, for example, later, and also f8 square is vacated for the second rook. And now Averbach finally uh, captures on f5. And after g takes f, he made a serious mistake. Instead of the correct e takes f in order to uh, create a great blockading square, for the knight, which would have led to a very sharp game. Instead of this, Averbach simply plays rook g2, probably vacating the g1 square for the second rook in order to exert pressure, strong pressure, on the only open g file. However, this mistake lets Kotov play f4 and close the king side. And as you see, white has failed to create a counterplay, an active play on the king, queen side. And on the king side, black now has a space advantage and more active pieces. So that means black is better now. The bishop is under attack. So uh, Averbach moves it to f2. And court of plays rook f6, threatening a very dangerous rook h6 after which the h3 pawn which is weak extremely weak and which uh, is very hard to defend as you see only the king defends it so after rook h6 the pawn would be attacked two times and it would be impossible to defend it that's why Averbach plays knight e2 now if black plays rook h6 Averbach's idea was was to uh, move his knight to g1 and defend the pawn however now Kotov makes his legendary move. He sacrifices his queen in order to start a king hunt. Queen takes h3. The idea is to drag out the king to f5 and with the remaining pieces, with the two rooks, the bishop and the knight, create checkmating threats. So Kotov, uh, Averbach must capture, of course, and the idea is to play rook h6 check. The king is forced to move to g4, and uh, now knight f6 check. Of course, if the king moves to g5, that would have led to checkmate in one, so white has the only move, namely king f5. So now the king is on f5, and as you see, the communication between the white king and the white pieces is completely blocked 
by the pawn chains, by the both the white pawn chain and the black pawn chain. And that means the white pieces are completely helpless. The white pieces cannot take part in the de defense of the king. And the king is all alone. However, black is down a queen. That means black must create immediate checkmating threats. But how to do it? You can pause the video and try to find Kotov's next move, which creates immediate checkmating threats. So, he moves his knight away from f6, knight d7. The idea is to open the f file, the knight isn't on f6 anymore, it isn't blocking the rook's way, and black is threatening rook f8, check. Besides that, after the knight moved from f6, the second rook now is cutting the king on the 6th rank. So black is simply threatening rook f8, check. The only move would be king g4, then rook g8, check. The king would be forced to return to f5, followed by rook f6, checkmate. So black has created checkmate in 3 threat. That's why Averbach played rook g5. So that after uh, rook f8 check, the king can hide behind the rook. Now, of course, there is no rook g8 uh, check anymore. But Potov simply plays knight f6 check, king returns to f5. Now, Kotov was in time trouble. That's why he repeated the position several times in order to reach the time control. So he plays knight g8 check, king g4, knight f6 check, king f5. Now, if he plays knight g8 check one more time, the position would uh, be repeated for, this, for three times. That's why instead of knight uh, g8 check, he captures on d5 again with the discovered check. King returns to g4, again knight f6 check, king f5, now again knight g8 check, king g4, knight f6 check, king f5, knight g8 check, king g4, and finally now he captures the rook. So Potov returns the exchange, he gets the exchange for the queen, but of course that isn't enough. White still has a great material advantage, but white pieces as you see, are completely useless. And the king is still in trouble. So, uh, Averbach captures the bishop, but now another strong move by Kotov. Rook f7, creating checkmate in two threat, namely rook g7 check, king f5, and rook f6 checkmate. And if, in order to prevent it, uh, white tries to play knight takes f4, in order to after reply to rook g7 check with knight g6 check, then still after rook takes g6 check and king f5, black has checkmate in one, namely knight e7 checkmate. That's why after rook f7, in order to take under control the f6 square, uh, Averbach plays bishop h4. Now there is no checkmate in two anymore, but out of place rook g6 check, king h5. Now, rook f g7, cutting the king uh, on the g file with the g rook and threatening rook h6 checkmate. That's why Averbach plays bishop g5, taking under control the h6 square. But of course, now black captures the bishop too. Rook takes g5. So as you see, black gradually returns the uh, material. King h4. Knight f6, again, creating checkmate in one threat, namely rook h5 checkmate. That's why knight g3, taking under control the h5 square, but of course putting the knight right under attack. So rook takes g3, uh, queen takes d6, and rook returns to uh, g6. Now again, black is threatening checkmate in one move. So there is nothing... Averbach can do. He just gave a check on b8, and after rook g8, his queen is under attack, and black is threatening checkmate. So the only thing he can do is to simply return the queen by capturing on g8, but of course, in this case, black would simply be up a knight. That's why, in this position, Averbach 
designed. And now I recommend watching another great game uh, that won a brilliancy prize in the same tournament in Zurich, in which the world champion Max Uwe sacrificed the rook in order to start a devastating counterattack. But first, hit the like button and subscribe, as it's really helpful for the channel growth.